Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me. My name is David Fullen, and I am the pastor of the Drakesboro and Jurgens Chapel United Methodist Churches. We have been studying together ways that we can share with our friends and neighbors the good news of Jesus. And this is our third meeting together for the fall. And uh, it's actually midsummer. So I'd like to share with you the content of today's Bible study. And uh, it will involve some Bible study and some lecture. And I hope that the time will be a blessing to you. When we talk together, we're going to gather this afternoon at the Drakesboro Church as we alternate sites that will be our place to meet. And as we gather, uh, we pray that we would be helped in our pursuit of doing all that the Lord commanded us to do and to receive his strength and to receive uh, a method for sharing that will stand up over time. I believe this is a good one. The, uh, the person who originally put it together was Gregory Kukul, K-O-U-K-L, and uh, the title of his book was called Tactics. And so we're into session three. And I think I'd like to rely on the handout a little more uh, than to read. Some of the reading in my notes is a little confusing. Uh, we begin with uh, the question, do arguments work? And we are still clearing out chapter two information and getting ready to tackle chapter three information. So um, our first verse comes from John chapter six, verse 44. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them and I will raise them up at the last day. A beautiful promise from our Lord Jesus Christ. No intellectual argument could ever substitute for the act of sovereign grace necessary for sinners to come to their senses. And then there is a couple of verses from Acts chapter 17 verses two through four, as was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving or giving evidence that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. Our next scripture is similar. Acts 18 verse 4, every Sabbath he reasoned with them, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Our first point, you cannot love someone into the kingdom of God. That comes as a shock and surprise, and you may be as surprised as I was, but it's really true you cannot love someone into the kingdom of God. It can't be done because many people 
who were treated with sacrificial love and kindness by Christians never surrendered to the Savior. Many who have, a, have heard a clear explanation of God's gift in Christ never put their trust in him. And then John 3, I'm sorry, John 6, verse 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of those he has given me, but raise them up on the last day or at the last day. You cannot love someone into the kingdom. Without the work of the Spirit, no argument, no matter how persuasive, will be effective. So pray for that work of the Spirit. Third, but neither will, oh sorry, second, without the work of the Spirit, no argument, no matter how persuasive, will be effective. And neither will any act of love or any simple presentation of the gospel. It's all useless without the spirit of the Lord, his anointing. So the key principle, point four, without God's work, nothing else works. But with God's work, many things work. Under the influence of the Holy Spirit, love persuades. And with Jesus' help, the arguments, they convince. By the power of God, the gospel transforms through each of these methods. I'm just looking at my clock. I forgot to set the timer when we began but I'm still going to go ahead. I would like to keep us close to our normal limits. So by the power of God, the gospel transforms through each of these methods. Now, why do you think God is just as pleased to use a good argument as a warm expression of love. I think because both love and reason are consistent with God's character. The same God who is the essence of love, look in 1 John 4 verse 8, also gave the invitation, come now, let us reason together. Isaiah 1, verse 18, therefore, both approaches honor him. Both approaches honor him. Point six, sharing the gospel is our task, but salvation is God's responsibility. That's from page 45. Maybe a new thought to some of us. And here is his principle, 100% God and 100% man. I am wholly responsible for my side of the ledger. And God is entirely responsible for his side of the ledger. I focus on being faithful, but I trust God to be effective some will respond and some will not. The results are his concern, not mine. This lifts a tremendous burden from my shoulders. Kathy Englert, Greg's mentor's wife, said, when I share my faith, I pay attention to how the sheep respond. Most will keep on eating grass, but once in a while, You'll notice that some lift their heads. There is a moment of recognition as they hear the shepherd's voice. Since she was confident 
the Holy Spirit was going before her. She was looking for those already hungry for the gospel, those whose hearts were being softened by the Spirit. Those were the people she spent time on. She uh, left the rest alone and committed them into God's care. Note six, Jesus modeled this same approach. When he encountered hostility from a group of Samaritans, he simply ignored them and went on to another village. Point eight, a modest goal that our author would like us to set, a modest goal. All I want to do is put a stone in someone's shoe. I want to give that person something worth thinking about. Something he can't ignore because it continues to poke him in a good way. Point nine. You don't have to get to the foot of the cross in every encounter. You don't have to try to close every deal. I think it's often better if you don't try. Point 10. First, the simple gospel is no longer simple. Yes, the truth is still the truth. It hasn't changed, but the world has changed dramatically. Many in our culture, especially the emerging generation, cannot understand the basic theological concepts and the language we've been using. Basic four steps to salvation approaches sound clunky, contrived, and overly simplistic. Religious slogans often substitute for thoughtful substance, making believers unattractive, unconvincing, and largely ineffective. Second, this is point 11, objections abound more than ever. Third, not all Christians are good closers. Yes, some are effective at getting a decision. For those with that gift, Harvesting takes little effort, but before the harvester can harvest, the gardeners work for a season until the fruit is ripe for harvest. John 4, verse 37, thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. Point 14. In this single sentence, Jesus made three things clear. The sentence is one sows and another reaps. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. We need more gardeners than harvesters. Fourth, the final reason I do not think it wise to make a beeline for the cross in every conversation. In most situations, the fruit is not ripe. The non-believer is simply not ready. She may have just begun to consider Christianity, dropping a message on her that is, from her perspective, meaningless, or simply unbelievable doesn't accomplish anything. Remember, this is point 15, remember your journey to Christ. Chances are you didn't go from a standstill to a total commitment. Instead, God dealt with you over time. There was a period of reflection as you sorted out the details. Point 16, when God opens a door of opportunity to me, this is um, our teacher, um, Greg. This is Greg talking. 
When God opens a door of opportunity for me, I pray quickly for wisdom, then ask myself, what one thing can I say in this circumstance? What one question can I ask? What single idea can I offer that will get the other person thinking? Then I simply try to put a stone in the person's shoe, something for them to think about, a question. Chapter three includes scenarios with the final question, what would you say? And I think I'd better get those so that I can share them with you. Okay, that's not it. I wonder where I put session three. Here it is. Okay. I think it is right another page or so. It's scene one. Yeah. Here are some scenes that I'll describe and you tell me or you respond what you would say. And maybe there's somebody there who you can share your answers with. You are at a dinner party with some of your close friends from church. The conversation ranges naturally over a number of interesting spiritual topics. Suddenly to your surprise and embarrassment, the host's 15-year-old son announces with some belligerence that he doesn't believe in God anymore. It's simply not rational, he says. There's no proof. No one had any idea he'd been moving in this direction. There's a stunned silence. What will you say? And now scene two. It's the night of your weekly Bible study. During the discussion of the Sunday Sermon on the Great Commission, a newcomer remarks, who are we to say Christianity is better than any other religion? I think the essence of Jesus' teaching is love, the same as all religions. It's not our job to tell other people how to live or believe. The rest of the group fidgets awkwardly, but says nothing. How do you respond? Here's the third one, scene three. You're riding the university shuttle with a friend who notices a Bible in your backpack. I've read the Bible before, he says. It's got some interesting stories, but people take it too seriously. It was only written by men. After all, and men make mistakes. You try to recall the points your pastor made a few weeks earlier about the Bible's inspiration, but come up empty handed. What do you say? Here's the fourth scene. You're sitting at the car dealer, watching TV and waiting with other customers for your car to be serviced. A television news program highlights religious groups trying to influence important moral legislation. The person sitting next to you says, haven't these people ever heard of separation of church and state? Those Christians are always trying to force their views on everyone else. You can't legitimate, sorry, you can't legislate morality. Why don't they just leave the rest of us alone? Other people are listening and you don't know what to create a scene, or sorry, you don't want 
you don't want to create a scene, but you do feel you must say something. So what's your next move? Remember, there's a 10 second window. That opportunity won't last too long. It's been predominantly uh, boys Ah, okay. So you want to say something, but you're also concerned about being sensitive to the needs and to the history, keeping the peace, preserving friendships, and not looking extreme. What if I told you there was an easy escape from the challenge that each situation presents? a way to minimize the awkwardness and engage the other person productively and gracefully. Isn't that tempting? Boy, that's wonderful. So we're getting ready to look into chapter four. I wonder where those answers were. Okay, here we go. I better get something in. He, uh, he promises that in chapter four, he'll give us the backstory to these questions. For the moment though, think about the following responses and how they begin to address the content of the person's remarks that still draw him into an interactive conversation. Yeah. So challenge one, it's not rational to believe in God. There is no proof. What do you mean by God is a response? That is what kind of God do you reject? What kind of God do you reject? What specifically is irrational about believing in God? since you're concerned about proof of God's existence, what kind of evidence would you find acceptable? What arguments for God have you considered? And what did you find wrong with them? Now, challenge two, Christianity is basically the same as all other religions. Christianity. The main similarity is love. We shouldn't tell others how to live or believe. How much have you studied other religions to compare the details and find a common theme? Why would the similarities be more important than the differences? I'm curious. What do you think Jesus's attitude was on this issue? Did he think all religions were basically equal? Isn't telling people to love one another just another example of doing what you're objecting to? Telling others how they should live and believe. Um, does he think all religions were basically equal? And isn't that telling people to love one another just another example of doing what you're objected to, telling others how they should live and believe? Challenge three, you can't take the Bible too seriously because it was only written by men and men make mistakes. Do you have any books in your litter in your library? Do you often find any truth in those books? Also written by humans who are prone to error. Is there a reason you think the Bible is less truthful or reliable than other books you own? Do people always make mistakes in what they write? If not, 
then why would you dismiss the Bible simply on that basis? Do you think that if God did exist, he would be able to use humans to write down exactly what he wanted? Challenge four. It's wrong to force your views on other people. You cannot legislate morality. Christians involved in politics violate the separation of church and state clause. Um, let me ask you, do you vote? When you vote for someone, are you expecting your candidate to pass laws reflecting your point of view? Wouldn't that essentially be forcing your views on others? How is that different from what you're troubled about here? Is it your view that only non-religious people should be allowed to vote or participate in politics? Or did I misunderstand you? Where specifically in the Constitution are religious people excused from the political process because of their spiritual convictions? Don't all laws force a morality of some sort? Can you give me an example of legislation that does not have a moral element underlying? I want you to notice several things about these responses. First, each is a question. My initial response in a situation like this is not to preach about my view or even disagree with theirs. Rather, I would I want to draw them out, to invite them to talk more about what they think. This takes a lot of pressure off me because when I ask a question, the ball is back in their court. It also protects me from jumping to conclusions and unwittingly distorting their meaning. The more they talk, the more information I have to work with pretty intimidating. So let's see. The more they talk, the more information I have to work with to maneuver the conversation, the more they talk. Second, each of these questions is an invitation to be thoughtful, to enter into thoughtful dialogue. Each is an encouragement to participate in conversation in a reflective way. Conversation that is reflective. That would be refreshing. The particular purpose for each question. I'm fading fast here, guys. So I'm going to try to get through. Uh, the questions are meant to make a point by indicating a problem with another person's thinking, with the other person's thinking. So now we uh, well this uh, this tactic that we're going to pick up right now is called the Colombo tactic. And uh, it comes to us with, uh, a, a, would be nice if we could view a film that included Colombo. But uh, what I'll do right now is just look at, uh, at these. There, there are, some scenarios again with the question, what would you do or what would you say? I think we've gone through those. So I'm going to skip that. Um, 
with the Colombo tactic, each response is a question. I want to draw them out to invite them back to, to talk more about what they just said. So each question is an invitation to thoughtful dialogue. Point 20. I have a particular purpose for each question, gathering information and make a point by asking a question to bring or to highlight a problem with the other person's thinking. So the Columbo, the response to all appearances, Columbo is this bumbling, ineffective, uh, lost detective. His trademark move, this is the second point. His trademark move is, I got a problem, he says, as he looks around, rubbing his furrowed brow. There's something about this thing that I just, that just bothers me. He pauses a moment to ponder his predicament, then turns to his suspect. You seem like an intelligent person. About, uh, well, turning to them again, maybe you can clear it up for me. Do you mind if I ask you a question? And uh, point C, something has just occurred to him he turns back to the scene, raises his index finger, and says, just one more thing. But one question leads to another. Soon Colombo has brought his suspect to the point of distraction and ultimately annoyance. I'm sorry, Colombo says in his, or to his suspect. I know that I'm making a pest of myself. It's because I keep asking these questions. But I'll tell you, he says with a shrug, I can't help myself. It's a habit now. The key to the Colombo tactic is to go on the offensive in an inoffensive way with carefully selected questions that advance the conversation. Never make a statement, at least at first, when a question will do. So advantages of asking, first, using a simple leading question keeps you in the driver's seat while the other person does all the work. Second, you'll get an education. You'll leave a conservative knowing more than you did when you arrived. Questions allow you to make progress on a point without being pushy, uh, of course they do. When you ask a question, you aren't stating your view, so you have nothing to defend. That's a good point. I ask questions meant to expose some of the weaknesses I saw in the displays. Um, fourth, Jesus used this method frequently. When facing a hostile crowd, he often asked questions meant to either challenge his audience's life. Oops, I lost it. You probably can tell I'm fading really fast. Well, uh, when Jesus faced a hostile crowd, he really uh, asked questions that he meant to challenge his audience since his detractors wanted just to expose him. Uh, the first step of our game plan is going to be gathering information. So at the beginning of a conversation, focus on one thing. 
gathering information. All right. I pray that you have done better than I through this time. I see that it's been about between 30 and 40 minutes, which is a good time. All right. Thank you, my friends, for being here today. May God bless you until we meet again. Good night.